Hey, I'm Mark Cuban, and today we're going to be talking about mogul support. Coach O Silver 365. Whether in business or sports, when building your team, are you more interested in getting someone who is an expert at something, or would you rather have someone with more potential? Question of the day. Olivier, I want an expert. Everybody's got potential. Everybody. I want someone who knows something. Give me someone who knows their sh every time because then I can turn it into something real. The key to being successful and, and achieving your dreams no matter what they are is finding something you really, really like to do and being great at it. When you're great at something, you get to write your own ticket. So I'm always going to hire the expert. If you just have potential, chances are you're working for the expert. Thanks, Olivier. Carissa Seacrest. I have to do an elevator pitch for a business proposal. I've never done this. What's your advice? Carissa, get on an elevator. Pitch. Ali the Great. Should I pay off the house or save cash at M Cuban? The real answer is depends on what your mortgage rate is. If your mortgage rate is over five, six percent, what you should do is refinance. If you have enough cash to just pay off the entire mortgage, that's great. But in this particular case, you probably want to talk to an accountant because depending on what state you live in, there's all kinds of different laws and rules for deductions. And so it can kind of get complicated. And as much as I'd like to give you advice, talk to your accountant's the best advice. Robert Reed II, as a hashtag entrepreneur, you get to be your own boss. How do you manage your time between work and home? So how do I manage my work-life balance now? It's easy. I'm rich. I do whatever I want. If I want to play with my kids, I play with my kids. If I travel, I jump on my plane. It really depends on where you are in your life. When I was first getting started, I was living six guys in a three-bedroom apartment, and so I had no work and home balance. I was working at night as a bartender, and all I did was work. I went seven years without a vacation, dude. That's what it's going to take. That's home life balance. Crypto Doom. If you're really into providing opportunity for people to grow their net worth, why the hate for crypto? ICO is the new IPO. Here's the thing about crypto, particularly Bitcoin. Bitcoin is worth what somebody will pay for it. Did you ever see someone who collected baseball cards and they were really, really, really proud of their baseball cards because they kept on saying they were going to go up in price? Comic books, same thing, even artwork. There's no real intrinsic value. You can't eat a baseball card or shouldn't eat a baseball card. Your artwork might look good on the wall, but not much you can do with it. Bitcoin, there's even less you can do with it. At least I can look at my baseball card and go, ooh, that's my favorite player. That's Roberto Clemente. I can look at artwork and go, wow. Crypto is a key that is so complicated for 99% of the population. Do you put it in a device? Do you print it out? How do you keep from being hacked? Who's going to host it for you? It's just so difficult that it's only worth what somebody will pay for it. So I say it's like gold. Gold's a religion. Now, people who are really into gold, they'll tell you that there's a bad depression and things go to hell in a handbasket. If you own gold, then you'll be okay. No, you won't. You carry around a gold bar, someone's going to hit your ass, knock you out, and steal your gold bar, and it's going to happen again and again and again. I'd rather have bananas. I can eat bananas. Crypto, not so much. Look, I can make a great argument for blockchain. There's a lot of applications and they'll be used, but you don't need public Bitcoin, BTC. You can create blockchain on your own without using all the available cryptocurrencies. It's not that I'm against cryptocurrencies. You just have to be very careful. At best, they're a store of value. Thanks, coins or die. MC Sound Studio. What makes a good business partner? A good business partner is somebody who makes me money. At the SNCK. Tax the robots by the hour, WTF question mark. So that tweet was in reply to this one. You are getting the short end with tariffs. If we as a country invest in robotics, we can build factories anywhere, including our own. That's how you replace cheap global labor. I'd rather pay you to monitor and fix robots than tax the robots by the hour. That's how you win. So it just so happens I have a company called Hire Robotics. And what does Hire Robotics do? They have robots that they put on factory floors. How do they charge the manufacturer to put those robots on the floor? They charge them by the hour. And they charge them effectively what a traditional laborer would cost, except they work 24 hours a day, they don't have to go to the bathroom, they don't eat, they don't call in sick. But the real context of this tweet was, how are we going to compete with China, Vietnam, and other countries who are manufacturing things that have moved from the United States to those countries and moved jobs with them? So if 
as part of our infrastructure spending with public-private partnerships, we invest in robotics, we'll be able to bring jobs back here and replace the factories that are in Asian countries in particular with factories here. That will allow us, particularly if we tax them by the hour, to be able to support social programs that we may not be able to afford based off of what our politicians are saying. It's okay to tax a robot by the hour because that money may come in and depending on who wins the election, it may pay for health care, it may pay for single payer, it may pay for UBI, it may pay for a lot of different things. But I'd much rather tax a robot who's pulling in factory jobs from overseas than any other option that I can see out there. At Larson J, tell me again why there's no ABC Shark Tank for nonprofits. We're also businesses that need investment for growth impact with a return that's priceless. Invest in what you value. I'm gonna tell you why we don't have Shark Tank for nonprofits or for kids. It seems so sweet and so nice. But the minute we say no to a nonprofit, we are the worst human beings on the planet. We can't do nonprofits. We can't do kids because we can't say yes to everybody. And so it's just better that we don't do it at all. From Chris Winters, Wentz Niner. M. Cuban, when you look for leadership in your organization, what's the biggest success factor? Any specific advice for engineering leadership? When I look for leadership, I look for a few things. One, it's somebody who can relate to people, someone who can define a vision, someone who is nice, and someone who recognizes that it truly comes down to helping people achieve their personal goals and aligning those with the goals of the organization. If you can take the goals of your organization, whether it's your company or somebody you work for, and align them with the interests of the people that work for you, you'll be a great leader. And you also have to recognize, in this day and age, people aren't looking for lifetime jobs at a company. They want jobs that'll help them improve their own skill set so they can find a better place in life that they enjoy. And if you help people realize their personal goals like that, great things will happen for you as a leader. Sade Wagner, I hope I said that right. Where's the first place to look to find a business mentor? How do you know if you can trust them? I'm not a big mentor guy. I've always been a believer that if you really want to learn something and be great at something, you have to put in the time. A lot of people look for mentors as shortcuts when in reality, maybe they, they help you a little bit, maybe they help you avoid some mistakes, but when you're just getting started out in particular, it's okay to make those mistakes. And more importantly, you have to make the commitment to put in the time to learn what you need to learn to be great at something or good at what you want to be good at. There you go, Shari. Stuart Plant. Being able to trust an organization's brand, people, and products are all key components of business success. Question mark. So through customer service, how do you gain and retain your customer's trust? Have you ever been a customer? You treat other people like you wanted to be treated as a customer. It's really, really, really simple. You know, you gain and retain a customer's trust by helping them achieve their goals. If you're in a business that is a service business, make their life easier. No one wants to go to a store and have to work at buying something. The most valuable asset everybody has is time. The one thing you cannot buy is time. The one thing you cannot get back is time. If you make someone's life easier, your customers' lives easier, if you help them save time, you will develop a great relationship with them and you will gain their trust. How you win? How do I start a business from scratch with no money, no credit, and no expert friends to help? You don't. From Cryptic at Crypto Unlocked. At M Cuban, hey Mark, I have a question I think many people would like to hear your answer. With all the talks of a recession coming, what do you think will help someone going through it for the first time? For example, millennials at M Cuban. It just so happens I answered that tweet and I have it right here. Number one, refinance your student loan and any other debt you have. The reality is right now, interest rates are at an all-time low, so it's a perfect time to go out there and refinance your debt. Two. Save as much as you possibly can, even if it means continuing to live like a student. The greatest opportunities come when you are one of the few people with cash. Number three, understand the economics of the company you work for and the impact a slowdown would have on your job. If you work for a company and there's a recession coming and you understand your role within that company, you can anticipate whether or not a slowdown in business is going to impact your job for better or worse. Number four, live as much like you can as a student. Because the ultimate rule is, the lower your bills, the lower your stress. Number five, 
Don't listen to any experts about whether or not a recession is coming or not. Nobody knows. They're all guessing. And they guess because it helps them get on TV or get interviewed or probably on a podcast because all economists love to do podcasts. Number 5A, because there's always a 5A. We live in a global economy whether we like it or not. The butterfly effect applies. We don't know what combination or big or little things will make things better or make things worse. A factory could close in Vietnam that impacts something else and that impacts the global economy. You just don't know. Number six, do all you can to be great at your job. But you have to be honest with yourself. Employees with no self-awareness are always the first ones to get fired. Number seven, be someone who reduces the stress of people around you. It's always the people who think they're irreplaceable who cause the most stress for everybody because they create this hurricane of hellishness, right? Reduce the stress of people around you. Be honest with yourself about whether you're a stress creator or a stress reducer because in my experiences, I'll always fire someone who creates stress, and I'll always look to keep people and give raises to people who reduce stress. From Jordan Snow, UGA Scotchman, do you believe all jobs should pay a living wage? Are not some jobs supposed to be steps towards careers? A great deal of wages are based on how easily replaceable people are, i.e. the cost of training new employees. Flipping burgers was never supposed to support a family of four. I truly believe that there should be a minimum wage of $15 an hour. And I say that because, A, if all companies have to pay the same minimum wage, then we all play by the same rules. But that's not even the most important part. When somebody's not able to pay for themselves and or their families, they go out and get government services. You know who pays for it? You. And for others, they're not even able to get the government services they need. So you know what happens? That's where we see people living on the streets. I don't want that. You know what else happens? That's when we see people have food insecurity. They can't feed themselves, they can't feed their kids. And so when we help people and we're compassionate and we allow them to live their lives with a living wage, then not only do we make the country safer, but we put everybody in a position where they're not dependent on government decisions and government resources and government tax revenue. Part two, when a company doesn't pay a minimum wage and they have employees that are receiving government assistance, that means we as taxpayers, including you, Jordan Snow, subsidizes that company. That's wrong. I literally went through my companies and asked and checked to see if any of our employees were receiving government assistance. In terms of their wages, I made sure that none were in a situation where they qualified for government assistance because their wages weren't high enough. I don't want taxpayers to be subsidizing my business. So let's just raise the minimum wage to a living wage and compete, because that's what American's all about. Capitalism, entrepreneurship, with a little bit of compassion thrown in, and I think we'll be a far better place to live, a far better country to live in. Presidential candidate Andrew Yang. Someone should definitely run against Trump in the Republican primary against William Welch. At M Cuban question mark. Higher upside than most. It's not over until I say it's over, Andrew. You just wait and see. I'm Mark Cuban, and this has been Mogul Support. I hope you learned something about business, entrepreneurship, and most importantly, making money, and even more importantly, being nice.